Hello friends, welcome to Village Idiots for Christ from Notes for Jesus and Just Plain Notes. We are in Matthew 13 today. I was going to just jump right in and get it going. I don't know if we'll make it all the way through. It is a rather lengthy, eh, no, I think we might make it through. We'll, we'll just jump in. We'll, we'll try and keep the comments limited only where I need to comment. So this is the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him, and he got into the boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he then he told them many things in parables. A farmer went out to sow his... So Jesus is standing on the shore. He's starting to teach the people. As a farmer went out to sow his seed, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good ground, where it produced a crop. A hundred, thirty, or sixty times um, what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. So this is talking about the conditions of men's hearts. And we're going to get into the explanation a little bit later here. But this is the condition. Four different grounds of hearts. And these... This describes all people. They have one of these four hearts. That's why Jesus limited these four. Disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing, uh, they do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn and I would heal them. Now a lot of people get mad at Jesus over this. They're going, well wait a minute, you're closing their ears, closing their eyes, closing their ears? But the key verse in this is this. Um, these people's hearts have become callous. Uh, that's verse 15. The problem was the people. The problem was their hearts were hard. How is it, how is it that, could God, that Jesus could gather the 12 apostles? He could get Mary Magdalene, his own mother, and others, other women that followed and met his needs because they hadn't hardened their hearts. People, A lot of people think, and, and, and the way it's written sometimes can be a little confusing, but God isn't hardening anybody's heart on purpose who is going to respond. But God knows the heart ahead of time. He knows which of the four grounds the heart is. And he can harden the heart in advance of someone's heart just getting hard on its own. In judgment, he can harden the heart. The point here is you have to harden your heart first. You're the one that starts that process. And God, in his foreknowledge, knows whether you're going to humble yourself in the future or not. That's how he hardened. That's how he could harden Pharaoh's heart in judgment against him because his heart was already hard. He made the choice. And these people that were around Jesus were making the choice to harden their hearts and for their hearts to be callous. God never hardens anybody's heart that's, that he knows is going to eventually soften and come to him. He only hardens those people's heart in judgment who have hardened their hearts already, and they are never coming. And so that's how this process works. This isn't about God arbitrarily hardening anybody's heart. This is God allowing people to harden their hearts because of their free will choice and, and following that process out, which is a hardened, callous heart. Um, so continue on, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many righteous, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you what uh, to see what you see, but did not see, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear. All the prophets of the Old Testament would have loved to have been there when Jesus, you know, John is the last Old Testament prophet. And you see his response to Christ. Can you imagine if Moses and, and Ezekiel and all the boys had been there? I mean, uh, Matthew and, uh, is it Matthew and, oh, the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew and Elijah show up and they show up to see Jesus, you know? you know, and he looks glorified, the Mount of Transfiguration later in this book, later in Matthew. And so, um, but uh, but the Old Testament prophets would have loved to have seen, been there when Jesus was there. 
And so let's go on now. We're going to get into the meaning of the foreground. So this will break it down. If we need to comment, we will. Listen then what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So these are people who just have no understanding. And the devil comes, he's the evil one, he snatches it away. This is the seed sown on the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. And so this is people who, who hear the meaning of what's going on in the kingdom. The, they hear the word of God and they get excited about it but they have absolutely no root and they only hold on to it in an, it did just in a kind of a, uh, they mentally ascend to the word. They get excited in their mind, but their hearts never turn towards the word. Uh, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but war, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, boy, wealth brings a lie. The deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Amen. So, the, the troubles and cares of life, the riches, wealth, working, uh, living your life, being a parent, all of these things can choke the life of God out of you. You can get so caught up in your physical life and all the traumas of life and dramas of life, the DTs, the dramas and the traumas of life, that those are the thorns that choke the life of the word out and kill it. But the seed falling on the good soil reverse to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now I want to use, I'm going to explain the verse 23 here. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 130 or 60 times what was sown. The prosperity gospel movement has been used in this verse, primarily in other verses, to, to see, you see how God prospers. You see what happens. You sow a good seed into our ministry. You sow $100 and God will give you 1000 These people say this all the time. And I'm not condemning anybody. If you're uh, into the whole prosperity gospel thing and your heart's right and you're not cutting, caught up in all this greed and all this avarice and all this stuff, that's fine. But this isn't about personal gain. And I, I remember when I got this clarification on this. What happens to a farmer? A farmer who goes out and sows seed in the field and he gains this, let's say he has a bumper crop. He gains a hundred times what was sown. He gets this huge bumper crop, perfect soil, perfect weather, perfect amount of rain. Everything is perfect. And he gets a super abundance of crop. He gets like two or three years worth of crop all at one time. He gets this hundredfold at 30, 60, 100. He gets the hundredfold. Okay. So people go, prosperity go, oh my gosh, look, God has prospered him so much and he's he's wealthy and all that. Okay, yes, he has prospered and he has more now because he is wealthy because he had this. But who is, here's the question, who is the crop for? The crop isn't just for the farmer. The crop is for everybody else the crop feeds. That's what this is about. This isn't about personal gain. You take whatever God gives you, and it's and yes, you get to eat off the crop. Of course, you're going to eat off the crop. You got to have, you got to survive. You can enjoy the crop and and enjoy being blessed by the crop and all that stuff. Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. But the point isn't the crop. The point is now you have some a gener, Now you're a generous man. If you're a generous man, now God has super abundantly blessed you that you can give to others. That now you can take this hundredfold and spread it out and serve others with it and love people. That's the point. The point isn't heaping it up on yourself and your own lust. The point of the hundredfold is to be able to have something to give, to be open-handed the way God's been open-handed with you and got you a great crop. Now he wants you to take that great crop and serve others with it. Matthew 25, be a sheep and not a goat. Feed and clothe people, help people. That's the point of this. This isn't about heaping this up on yourself. The point of this is to have something in your hand to give somebody else. That's the good ground. A good heart wants to give. And God gives them. A generous man has more and always has more to give. God wants to keep blessing you, keep blessing you, keep blessing you in your generosity so you can keep giving out and being a blessing to others. My friend Dwight, you know, he got a settlement by the government for disability and he got a, some money and he's getting a, so much uh, a month. for. His, and he told me that he's been giving money away. He said, Josh, I have more now than when I started. That's God blessing him because he's open-handed and he's a generous person and he's sharing what he has with others. So God's getting him more. It's just 
but it isn't about Dwight hoarding it up on himself. It's about Dwight being able to be open-handed and give even more. That's the point of the parable. Amen. You want that kind of heart. The parable of weeds. Uh, we're only nine minutes in. Good. The parable of the weeds. Jesus told him another parable. The parable of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull up uh, go and pull them up? No, he said, because while you're pulling up the weeds you may uproot the wheat as well. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in the bundles to be burned, then gather the barn and bring it into my uh, gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. All right, man, let's see here. And he told another parable, but I want to see if he explains. Let's see. Okay. All right. I'm tell you what I'm gonna do here. Um this parable of wheat, mustard field. Well, let's just keep reading. We're gonna get to the explanation of the weeds. Okay, so just let's just keep trucking through. I don't want to jump ahead here. The parable of the mustard seed and yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows it is the largest of garden plants becomes a tree so the birds come and perch in its branches. And then you, you know, you sow a little bit into the kingdom. You know, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. And it's the smallest seed Yet with faith it grows. Again, and again, it grows to be a blessing, not just to you, but to others. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through. Amen. The kingdom of God spreads. As you share, it gets, it's like yeast going through flour. It just changes the complexion of everything. The more you're sharing, the more you're giving Christ away, the more you're changing everything around you is what he's saying. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. And that's Psalm 78 too. Now here's the parable of the weeds explained. We're in verse 36. And again, we're only 12 minutes in. Then he said to the crowd and went to the house uh, then he left the crowd in one of the houses. His disciples came to him and he said, explain, explain the parable of the weeds in the field. Now, I'm going to explain this too. This is easy to break down. It took me a while to get here, but you'll, you'll like this one. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands, the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, for the, for the uh, sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, that's the devil. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. And, you know, there's people who don't believe in an actual devil. But yet Jesus said there's a devil sowing dark people into you, uh, into the good seed, sowing, sowing weeds into the wheat. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will, be, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. What this means is this. This is talking about, in chronological order, the great white throne judgment, the end of Revelation 19 or 20, and then the new heavens and new earth after that in 21 and 22. So what happens is the weeds or the unrighteous, the wicked, are gathered together uh, right before, before this great white throne in Revelation 20, and they are judged. And all of these people standing before Christ, this is Christ on the throne, None of them are saved. None of them are names are written in the book of life because the the Christian, the righteous, they stand at the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. Two separate judgments, one for the righteous, one for the wicked. So all these people are standing before the great white throne judgment, and one by one, they are they're being their lives being examined, determined that they they don't know Christ, and they're being deposited by angels into a lake of fire. And they, even the book of life is there just. So God cannot be accused of being unfair, even though there's no possibility of their name being in the book of life, they still check it anyway. And so these are the weeds being burned. This is the weeds at the end of the age, past past human history, now in judgment, and they're being burned first, 
and they're being done away with and burned first, and then the wheat is gathered into the his father the father's barn. The wheat we are the wheat, the righteous, and we're gathered after this judgment where the wicked are dispensed. We are brought into the the new heavens and new earth. So chronologically, they line up perfectly. The weeds are the weeds are dealt with first, and then then the righteous are gathered into the new heavens and new earth. So that's how that works. Amen. There you go. Uh, the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Then his joy went out and sold all he had and bought that field. So I love this. It, it's like a treasure. The kingdom of God is like treasure in a field where you, you discover and you, you're so intent about about not li- missing it. You not only want the treasure, but you want the field all around the treasure to make sure there's no possibility you lose the treasure because you're buying the field that the treasure sits in. Man, God wants you to, you want to be so hungry for God, you want everything you can get out of God. You want all of it. You want everything he wants to share with you. You want to grab, you want to take hold of not only what he's sharing with you, but make sure you've, (laughs) everything around you is part of this. And that's the buying of the field. Amen. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had and bought it. Man, whatever you have to do to get the kingdom, whatever you have to do, whatever it costs you, get rid of everything, sell everything and get the kingdom of heaven. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Man, whatever it takes to get the kingdom, get rid of whatever in your life is keeping you out of the kingdom. Take hold of the kingdom. The kingdom is more valuable than anything else in the universe. The kingdom of heaven. You want that kingdom. You want to be a part of that. The parable of the net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was left, let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. They sat, then they sat down and collected good fish in basket, but threw the bat away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angel will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Here you go. Here's the explanation. And throw and throw the uh, the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures and old. I don't understand what that means. Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven, those are people who know about the kingdom of heaven, is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The understanding Christ was bringing was the new understanding of the kingdom. So he's bringing new understanding. But they did have, there was some value to the Old Testament law, not for righteousness sake, but understanding what sin was and stuff. So that old and the new were mixed together when Christ came. Amen. And that's a good thing. Amen. Uh, Prophet without honor. When Jesus had finished, we're almost done, by the way. Uh, 17 minutes in, we're doing good. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? uh, Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. This is the hometown boy. I've now, let me read this again. This is verse 53 to 57. Listen to what they're saying. Because you know what? If the hometown, if you have a home hometown boy, he's a, uh, he becomes a famous baseball player, a basketball player, a football player. He becomes a famous senator or a congressman or he's the president of the United States. Everybody's proud. In that town, everybody's proud of the hometown boy. But they weren't proud of Jesus from his own hometown. When Jesus finished these parables, he moved on from coming to his hometown. He began teaching the people in their synagogues, and they were amazed. So they were amazed at his teachings. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. They were... I never understood this. He's the hometown boy. He's a guy you go, man, Jesus, he's from Nazareth, man. Where do I live? I live in Nazareth, man. I'm proud. That's a guy doing miracles, teaching people. He lives in Nazareth, man. We're proud of Jesus, citizen of Nazareth. Yeah, They do this all, all over the place. 
it, you see going down there, you know, uh, uh, something Ohio, uh, hometown of Neil Armstrong, hometown of Bill Clinton, hometown of Hillary Clinton. These signs on the road, so people are proud when they when someone famous or or even infamous, someone uh, that people know about, comes from their hometown. Well, these people, Jesus was becoming known, and they got offended. And it's like that's the hometown boys doing cool stuff. What are you offended about? So cra- I, I still don't understand the offense here. I, it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me, because he was a Joseph's son, the carpenter's son. And that turns you away from Jesus? That just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Again, this is one of those passages you go, man, what was wrong with people? Why did they get upset? Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his is not without honor except in his own town and his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. They had no faith in Jesus. Ah, that's just Jesus. Man, guy can't play guy can't play baseball, he can't play football, he doesn't date any girls. We think maybe Jesus is gay. We don't know. He's he's a little funny. He's a little too nice. But I don't know. I know could Messiah. Yeah, right. That guy who never dates no girls and stuff. Messiah. I don't think so. You know. I'm sure the talk. You know, the guy didn't date. As far as we know, Jesus never went out with Mary Magdalene. Or any date, even no matter what the Da Vinci Code tells you, it's nonsense. So. <laughs> But again, I still don't understand the offense. And because of their lack of faith, he couldn't do a lot of miracles. The faith, their lack of faith so permeated the place, they couldn't do many miracles, which is amazing. Again, verse, verse 58, he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. It affected his ability to do miracles. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Well, that's it. We made it through 13. Good deal, O'Neill. Appreciate you. Love you. And uh, we all uh, got... We got. I'm trying to get this better. We have Ernie, we have Bert, and we have the Chicken Sisters, uh, Noah, Tirza, Hogla, Milka, and let's see, Ma, Mala. I'm still reading. I haven't memorized yet. Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. You can find them in number twenty six. I've always loved the names together. Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. So that's the Chicken Sisters. We got five chickens. One, two, three, four, five. We got chickens there. Chicken, chickens everywhere. Hey, Amen. Love you, love you, can't get enough of you. We appreciate you, and we love you, and we will see you. Uh, again, we're putting out some good music here. Hope you're enjoying the music. We're sure enjoying putting it out there for you. Probably not a poem tonight. I'm pretty tired tonight, So, but I'm going to get some kind of song out. See you guys. So, Anyway, we love you, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a blessed day. Amen. <laughs>